Hello, my name is Sean Ditchko with the University of British Columbia Physics and Astronomy Department. And welcome to the first video in a series that seeks to explain some of the nuclear physics behind the problems at the nuclear reactor in Fukushima. By the end of these videos, you'll understand that the problems at Fukushima are not related to nuclear fission directly, but rather related to the heat created by beta decay of the fission products. The nuclear waste, in other words, is itself getting really hot because of beta decay. And you'll understand what I mean by the end of this video. You'll also understand what this chart of nuclides is all about. We're going to take a tour of this and show the half-life perspective and the decay mode perspective and look at the fission products of uranium. Um, and all of that should be a little bit crazy sounding right now, but we're going to have a whole few videos to explain uh, what all this is about. So stay tuned. This chart of nuclides from the Brookhaven National Laboratory illustrates every single isotope of every element. There's a little square here for every isotope of every element. And if you uh, look closely, there's a little pop-up with a letter O for oxygen, N for nitrogen, C for carbon, say, and the number 16 represents the atomic mass. Let's, let's click on carbon, say carbon 12. After uh, clicking on that, you'll see information about the element here and its abundance. There's 98.89% of all carbon in the, uh, on Earth is this particular isotope of atomic mass 12 and it's stable. There would otherwise be a half-life given here for the decay. And uh, we can zoom in by choosing from this menu here. We can zoom in on that isotope on the chart. And what just happened here is we had this zoom out where we saw everything and then we're progressively zooming in closer and closer on that particular element we clicked on. And you can see all the little squares here showing up for each nuclide, each isotope of each element. And if we go to zoom level two, we can see nicely that there's a whole row here for carbon. Each row represents a different element. Um, the number of protons on this chart increases as you go vertically upwards, and the number of neutrons increases as you go to the right. And so you can see every isotope of carbon that's known to exist. Uh, carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14, which is an important one. Let's zoom back out just to see a full perspective. This particular website doesn't give us uh, axes, so let's make some fade in here. That's better. And uh, as a substitute for axes, they put these blue bars on the chart. Uh, let me explain what that means. Just like on this periodic table of elements, which you're familiar with, where the last column contains the noble gases that are chemically neutral because they have reached a stable electron configuration. Uh, similarly, with the nucleus, there's also um, nuclear energy shells as well for protons and for neutrons. And these blue bars are just strategically placed at these positions where there's a full energy shell for each thing. So horizontally, you have blue bars where the, the number of protons completes a, a shell. And so at 82 protons, that's something special. And then for uh, 50 protons, it's also special. And for 82 neutrons, you can see here, and for 126 neutrons. I'll come back and have a little bit more to say that about that in a minute after you understand what the colors on this picture mean. These colors represent half-lives of the different isotopes. And you can see the legend here, which is kind of a weird notation. Um, this means 10 to the power of 1 seconds. And this, is, this color is 10 to the power of 10 seconds, which is a really long time. And, uh, and here's a really short time. This is microseconds, 10 to the power of negative six. So if we click on a particular element, say barium-141, then uh, we'll see the half-life down here. And this says 18.27 milliseconds. That's what the M stands for here, milliseconds. This number seven after the unit is the uncertainty in the least significant digit. So writing this in usual notation would look more like this. It would be 18.27 milliseconds plus or minus 0 0.07 milliseconds. Or typically you'd actually see 
plus or minus 0.07 milliseconds, just like that. Or consider nickel 66. It has a half-life of 54.6 hours, plus or minus 0.3 hours. Um, you'd also see the units Y for years or S for seconds. So we can see that the color black represents the isotopes, which are the most stable. These nuclides don't uh, decay very often at all. And you notice there is a, a sort of a black curve in the middle of all of this uh, stuff here. And what's interesting about these blue bars now, I want to return to those now that you understand what these colors mean, is that there tends to be um, a large amount of black squares in the blue bars. So the black squares, remember, represent stable nuclides. And you'll see for Z equals 50, and that is the number of protons equals 50. And if you look at your periodic table of elements, you'll see number 50 is tin, Sn is tin. And from this chart, you can see that the width of the chart at this particular position, Z equals 50, is the widest anywhere. This means that there are more isotopes of tin than there are of any other element. And uh, this is possible because Z equals 50 is a special number of protons which completes a nuclear energy shell. And so it's a, this particular number of protons can tolerate a large variety in the number of neutrons. That's why it goes so far to the left and the right. And you can see that pattern in other places too, um, particularly here for the, the number of neutrons equaling 82 is special. And so you see sort of a vertical line of black squares on top of each other because this number of neutrons is nice. You know, the nuclides are, tend to be more stable with 82 neutrons. And likewise, for 50 neutrons, it tends to be a vertical line of black here with lots of stable isotopes. So that's kind of interesting. And also 126 is really stands out because beyond that, um, you get nothing that's really stable at all for quite a while until you get over to this point here. That's quite, quite interesting. This chart also explains which isotopes you'll expect to see in nature. You know, knowing that all the elements on Earth were created once in an explosion of different stars, and all of those fragments from those explosions have squished together into this thing we call Earth. You know, that was a long time ago, and that was about four and a half billion years ago. And so the only isotopes you should expect to see on Earth now are the ones that have really long half-lives. And so it's these black ones that you tend to see. And if we were to click on one of these, like say, lead 206, that's a, a stable version of lead. And we look over at the periodic table of elements, you'll see that its uh, atomic mass is about 206. It turns out to be 207.2. .2. And we're actually going to calculate that in a minute as an exercise to get you used to this uh, chart of nuclides. Now let's just make sure you see the connection between the periodic table of elements and this chart of nuclides. The periodic table of elements says that there's 118 different elements that are known to us. And this chart of nuclides says the same thing actually, but also displays a separate square for every isotope of each of those elements. And an isotope is um, a nuclide with different numbers of neutrons. So same number of protons and then add or subtract neutrons and you have different, those are different versions of the same element, different isotopes they're called. Now as you go to the right on the periodic table of elements, you're adding protons. So potassium has 19 protons and then calcium has 20 and then scandium has another one, 21 protons and so on. And with the chart of nuclides, that's like going upwards. And so if we find potassium here, with uh, 19 protons and uh, atomic mass 44, say, if we go up, we'll be adding a proton. Let's zoom in a little bit, and that's a little easier to see. So we have potassium here. If we go up, we'll see calcium, letter CA appears there. And the next one up should be scandium. That's one to the right of calcium on the periodic table, uh, but going to the right on the periodic table is like going up on this chart of nuclides because the proton number increases as you go upwards here. And sure enough, as we go up from calcium, we see scandium. And let's zoom level two and you can see uh, all the different letters. 
So we have calcium and then up is scandium. Up from that is titanium and then vanadium above that. What's different on the chart of nuclides is that when you go sideways, it's now displaying all the different isotopes to the right and to the left. So all the different numbers of neutrons that are possible with this given number of protons. Now let's zoom in on one of these isotopes, say uh, carbon-14. That's a special isotope you may have heard of because that's what scientists are measuring the decay of when they're doing radioactive dating of archaeological finds. And you'll see that carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,700 years, plus or minus 30 years. If we write this in over here, this carbon-14, and then the 6 is below here. Let me just make sure you understand what these numbers mean. This is the atomic mass, and it's the total number of protons plus neutrons. And this number down here, the 6, is the number of protons, also called the atomic number. And this number 6 is what determines the chemical properties of the element. And that's what determines this letter. What element is it? Is it carbon? Is it nitrogen? That's what the number of protons determines. Now, if we switch to the periodic table of elements, we'll see that the uh, atomic mass of carbon is not 14, though, even though we know that this carbon-14 exists. Instead, the uh, atomic mass is closer to 12. And why is that? Let's go look at our interactive chart of nuclides, and we can see that from the color scheme that this carbon-14 is a lighter shade than the other isotopes. And we can see that it's actually got a half-life of about 5,700 years, which is fairly short in the time scale of the Earth's existence. And, uh, and, and carbon-12, on the other hand, accounts for almost 99% of all carbon, and it's stable. And so this is why the uh, periodic table shows an atomic mass closer to 12, because most of the carbon is that particular isotope. Now, when you see this chart, and notice that carbon-14 has such a short half-life of 5,700 years, um, you might wonder why we see any of it on Earth at all, because that's such a short instant on the time scale of the Earth's four and a half billion years existence. And uh, it turns out that uh, nitrogen in the upper atmosphere is being turned into carbon-14 when it gets hit by cosmic rays. And the fact that this is occurring at a constant rate is uh, what allows us to have carbon-14 around, and also the continual constant rate of production is what's responsible for this being a reliable method of dating, since the dating procedure assumes that the carbon-14 concentration in the atmosphere has been constant over the past many thousands of years. Now, the last thing we're going to look at on this chart is uranium-235. So I just clicked on that, and then we'll zoom in. Uranium-235 has a half-life of 700 million years, and it's actually not that long on the scale of the Earth's age of 4.5 billion years. And so it's slowly decaying away, and there's no uranium being produced on Earth, you know, like cosmic rays produce carbon-14. That doesn't happen with uranium. Uranium is only produced in supernova or large star explosions. So this uranium-235, which is the important isotope for fission, this is the one that actually does the fission. It's fissile. The 238 isotope of uranium is not fissile. But since 238 has a much longer half-life, we'll see that its half-life is about the age of the Earth, four and a half billion years. Uh, since it's such a long half-life, that's way more abundant. 99.3% of all uranium, when you get a, a sample full of uranium, 99.3% of it will be this isotope, 238. But that's not the one they want for their reactors or for the nuclear weapons, for that matter. They want the uranium-235. And so some uh, types of nuclear reactors require a, an enrichment, they call it, enriching your uranium sample and increasing the concentration of the uranium-235 isotope in that sample. And this enrichment is really hard to do, and that's a good thing, because it's the main obstacle that prevents anyone from producing nuclear weapons. In this video, we've introduced the chart of nuclides, which displays every isotope horizontally for each element, and the elements are arranged vertically. And it can also be color-coded to show half-life here, and then that explains which isotope is more abundant on Earth. I also talked about uranium-235, which sets the stage for talking about nuclear fission. 
and the science behind the problems of Fukushima, which we'll discuss in the next video.